Model Horse Drastic Customizing is one of my favorite things in this hobby, and I'll show you how I did it in this detailed video. Also, all the tools and supplies I'll mention are linked below. Enter the proud Arabian mare, or also known in the model horse hobby as Pam. One of Briar's older models, this copy is almost 46 years old. I want to preserve a lot of her old charm, but I also want to give her a more modern confirmation by slimming her down, straightening her legs, and giving her a fresh look with new hair. She will look very different, but if people respond, wait, is that a Pam? I feel I will have succeeded. Her face is my favorite part. Since I want to make sure I lengthen her a bit, I'm drawing out her current stance to refer to later. I'm also referencing a Photoshop manipulation I put together as part of a worksheet I made last year. Permanent markers help me guide where I want to cut. It's incredibly important to put on a snugly fitting particulate mask and goggles to protect me from plastic dust and little chunks that might strike my eyes. Safety first, art second. I prefer to drill a little bit at a time, taking my time. Oof, here is why we wear a mask. Thick areas of plastic just as the tail base of the job for the handsaw. Two days and three hours later I was ready to reassemble. This is a dry fit to see how things are coming together before I glue anything and to make sure that I indeed slimmed her down as much as I wanted. My lovely friend the humble masking tape helps temporarily hold everything together. Next up is a session with a heat gun. This will also require a bowl of cold water for setting the plastic and barbecue gloves for heat protection. I wanted to straighten out this mare's knock knees and splayed hooves, so I'll use heat to bend them straight. I find it's important to go slow with this tool to make sure I don't accidentally burn my model. Going slow helps ensure even distribution of heat throughout the legs and gives me time to test how fast it's softening. Here I'm holding my heat gun no closer than a few inches and I'm only using the lowest setting. Once the plastic is soft, I slowly bend the model into shape. It's best to do this in small increments rather than one big move all at once. Ooh, there we go, that's looking better. Happy now, I dunk it into the cold water for a little bit to help it set in its new position. Second dry fit. Now I glue the parts together using cyanoacrylate glue and baking soda as an activator. As you can see, some seams are just too wide to add glue right now, so I'll use tape for a bit longer to help. 
those wide seams I'll fill with epoxy. It's important to let that sit, so I cut two wooden dowels while I wait. One is wide enough to fit between her shoulders and the other between her haunches. Grabbing 14 gauge galvanized steel wire, I wrap strands of wire around each rod, making sure to leave plenty of extra length. The galvanized steel is tough, so I use pliers to help bend it, and I take my time. Stuffing foil around the rod helps hold it up while I wait for the glue to set. The second rod was easier, perhaps because I had more room to reach inside. I sprinkle baking soda into the glued areas of both to help strengthen those areas and set them faster. To sit overnight before moving on to the next step just to ensure everything had plenty of time to cure. I also use this convenient pause to tidy up my workspace. This makes it easier for me to keep the model clean as I work because otherwise I'm a messy person during creativity. Next is to make a reinforcement for the core. There are lots of different ways to do this but here I am cutting three sections of wooden dowel fixed together with wire. Privating a quick and easy method to make sure everything is proportionate while it's still easy to make adjustments. Time to fill the body cavity with more aluminum foil. I also used it to simulate where I needed to add putty to adjust her hoof heights. This made it easier to adjust her overall posture without needing to use clay yet. Once I'm happy with that, I add in more CA glue and baking soda. I don't glue all the gaps just yet, but I glue enough to help secure everything in place without needing all that tape. She's definitely skinnier now. Since I'm going to add a bit of epoxy putty to her midsection to sculpt back in that gap, I wanted to make sure she stays skinny, so I need to squish in some of the plastic. With the heat gun, I slowly work on squishing the end of the plastic into the foil. Because that foil reflects heat, it's even more important I wear those thick barbecue gloves. I didn't want to dunk her into a bowl of cold water and get water in all of that foil, because now it would take her interiors forever to dry. Instead, I wrapped an icy cold cloth around her and stuck her in my refrigerator for a bit to set the plastic. The heat gun is a bit of an intermediate to advanced skill set, and you can see that even I warped your plastic a little too much.
Dremel to the rescue. I used the sanding barrel bit to knock back that rippled plastic. I'll finish correcting with epoxy later. While I was at it, I also carved down the girth section and roughed up the plastic to ensure that my epoxy putty will have plenty of tooth to grip. Okay, back to that neck. The general rule of thumb is that they are approximately the same length as the head. This varies of course by breed, age, and gender, but it's a good start. I use a marker to measure this out on my wire. I also measure again to make sure I have enough wire for inside the head itself. Sorry it's a little off camera. I always wear my safety goggles when cutting wire. Large areas that I plan to re-sculpt, such as necks, need sturdy support for all of my new epoxy putty, which is why I love using galvanized steel. True, it's hard to bend, but pliers make short work of that, and the reason it's hard to bend with my fingers is also the reason it's sturdy for drastic customizing. I take my time adjusting the wire to get the neck and head pose I want. Sometimes this takes me several attempts to get it right. I check that the neck is looking good with a paper mock-up, which then I use as a guide for a tape armature. As I was trying to level out her hooves, I noticed that part of the problem was a cannon bone that was a little too short. Having a pair of calipers and marking joints can be an effective way to compare proportions and yep, sure enough, that leg was about an eighth of an inch too short. Back to the drill. I did switch drills midway through this project, so what you're seeing now is a flex shaft drill instead of the handheld rotary drill. Either will work for drastic customizing. When I'm drilling for a wire insert, I make sure to drill deep enough to add plenty of wire. This strengthens the leg. I drop in cyanoacrylic goo and insert the wire into the first piece of the leg. Baking soda again to help it cure. Then I check to see just how much length I need to insert into the other part of the leg and make my cut. After gluing and before adding baking soda, I make sure I'm truly happy with the final placement as viewed from all angles. It takes me a few tries to get it right. For a smoother transition between plastic and the epoxy putty I'll add soon, I like to widen this gap. I learned the hard way that straight cuts can sometimes leave lines that show up later in the finished work, but angled cuts result in more blended epoxy putty application. Ready for epoxy now. I use two-part epoxy putties because they cure through a chemical process and do not require baking. Milliput, Aves, and Magisculp are some examples. I mix equal parts of resin putty and hardener thoroughly for six minutes to avoid epoxy cracking or lifting in the future. Then I apply small amounts to the model.
water or isopropyl alcohol helps smooth the putty, which is especially helpful since I'm wearing gloves through the sculpting process. For her midsection, I make sure to really stuff the epoxy inside the cavity and under the plastic so that when done, I have layers of epoxy gripping the plastic from both inside and outside. I'm intentionally leaving the first layer rough to make it easier to apply the following layers of epoxy putty. I double check my proportions and let that sit overnight. As long as I'm using well-fitting nitro gloves without much texture on them, it is actually possible to sculpt smooth additions. There is a slight learning curve compared to sculpting with bare hands, but since two-part epoxies can cause allergic reactions in some people, I make sure to wear mine now. Water will help, and if needed, I find smoothing with a dampened lint-free shop towel gets the putty even smoother than with bare hands. I use some scraps of matte board to help fix her neck into place, with more of the glue and baking soda combo, then I added generous amounts of glue to fix the head into the wire. I'm using masking tape to temporarily hold her secure as the glue set. Stuffing epoxy putty inside her head and onto her neck helps further ensure a secure hold. The tape armature is really just a temporary structure to make it much easier to apply the first few parts of epoxy putty. These following layers of epoxy are the real armature as they give the rigid strength needed for the muscle sculpting. I make sure these layers are full of texture to give the muscle layers plenty to grip. Now necks are tricky. It's totally normal if you have to redo them. In my case, mine was too short and I did have to rebuild the base. I wanted to show a few clips to illustrate that it is normal for art to be a messy back and forth process. That's better. All right, now that I'm back on track, let's start adding muscle sculpting. I sculpt necks from a series of noodle shapes and triangular shapes. Each represent different muscle groups, and while that looks different for every horse, the main groups stay the same, so the process is the same. On paper, it's as simple as that. In practice, it's, well, practice. Lots and lots of practice. I'm hoping to create a tutorial someday that clarifies how I sculpt these muscle groups, but for now, here's the process as demonstrated on my pen. And just as before, I often have to add or subtract to this until I'm happy with it. I finish my neck using the detailing method I highlighted in my tutorial on how to sculpt wrinkles, which is on my channel. Next is her lovely face. The ears I featured in a separate tutorial, so if you want to see how I made those, check out that video. Her offside nostril was smaller, so I drilled that off and sculpted a new one that matches in size.
Sharpie markers help me keep track of what details I want to add. A little scuffing again to make sure everything sticks properly. And then a series of those noodles along with circles and blobs. My clay shaper tools are especially helpful to blend these shapes and reshape them. Water is used to further help with blending and smoothing. After cure time, a quick spritz of primer helps me see what is unified and what still needs work. Much as with the ears, I have a tutorial of sculpting the mane already on my channel, so here are all the key steps in a much more condensed, faster pace. Go check out that video for all the tips for why I'm doing what I'm doing. What I didn't feature in its own tutorial was the tail, and <laughs> let me tell you, that's because the tail was tricky. At first I built a really cool armature, then I realized I might not be able to paint underneath of it or paint her croup. It kind of hurt my soul, but I ripped that off and created a new design that wouldn't cause as many painting challenges. I had already completed some of her prepping and priming as I re-sculpted her. During the drilling stage, I knocked back her rough seams and other imperfections. I sanded her all over and spritzed her with primer to see what needed more work. So really all that was needed after completing her sculpting was some final rounds of all over sanding and a few layers of primer. Also important to note is that I bathed my models before each primer layer to remove epoxy dust, finger oils, and anything else that might cause the primer and paint layers to lift. Both the sanding and the primer help smooth what needs to be smooth, unify her surfaces, and most importantly, give excellent tooth layers of paint, which by the way, I will be featuring in a second step-by-step -step video. Previously, I showed you how I re-sculpted this bar model horse. Now, I'll show you how I painted her in acrylics and oils step by step. In my previous video, I left you with my prepped and primed bar model horse. She is also my project for National Model Painting Month, better known as Namo Pemo. As part of challenging myself, I'm going to break a convention of model horse painting and instead of finishing with my white markings, I'm going to start with those. I'm taking my cue from fine art where artists paint an acrylic underpainting beneath their oil layers. Sometimes these underpaintings can be quite complex and that's the part I'm really excited for. I want to explore how complex I can make my acrylic underpainting and then see how that affects your oil layers. An airbrush session is next. I mix my own airbrush paint using golden fluid acrylics and some airbrush medium to thin them in ratios of two parts paint to one part medium. I do this because I like the look these paints generate when thinned and because I use them for other art forms so that saves a buck. The colors I mix took inspiration from my chestnut oil painting tutorial which I'll link below. I wanted to show these new mixtures as they are a good example that almost any tutorial or any color recipe can be modified for other media and tweaked to your taste. The airbrush I'm using is technically a detail airbrush and better suited to smaller models, but I've made friends with it. It and I were in sync, we've got this. I set my airbrush compressor to roughly 25 psi, which gives me a nice even spray with this paint mixture. I start with the lightest colors and work my way to the darkest colors.
I meet my first challenge. My needle had a tiny bend at the tip I did not spot when I put it in my brush. Bent needles are one cause of splattered paint. I try to bury these splatters with more layers of paint, but that just cues disaster and ultimately makes her too dark. Okay, so we're not in sync, we're not vibing. Luckily, airbrushing is forgiving if you just take a break and come back fresh. And much like with oil painting, it's easily fixed if you kept your layers smooth. Thank goodness I did. After fixing my needle, I use all of my same colors again, repeating my steps and burying the flaws. And sometimes you just gotta believe There's something that'll give you relief There's something that'll have what you need What you need Ta-da! Phew, that was a little scary for a moment. But ooh, that looks nice. I wanted her to look less orange and more neutral in color than my chestnut oil painting tutorial horses, and I think that worked. One of the things I love about Nomo Paymo is that it encourages model horse artists all around the world to challenge themselves, and here I am challenging myself to add a sense of shadow and highlight with their acrylic mane and tail. This will also help greatly reduce how many oil layers I will need to paint later. Acrylic underpainting finished. Ooh yeah, I'll admit it's very tempting to call her finished. My goal for the layers of oil paint is to add even more life with shadows, highlights, and details. Soft brushes and thin layers are key here. I'm using assorted artist grade paint brands mixed with small amounts of liquid, which helps speed dry time so I can paint my next layers in 24 to 36 hours. That first layer came out a bit too red for my taste, so a few days later I added some ultramarine blue to my darker mixtures. Ultramarine blue is the color complement to the burnt sienna that was giving too much of a reddish orange tone, and when you mix complementary colors together, they dull the results. Exactly what I needed is a color theory known as neutralizing. From here out, I use my darker mixtures for shadows and muscle shading. I use mid-tone and lighter colors to build up the highlights. As I paint, I'm thinking about how light falls on a real horse and what that does to their color. Mm, 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 mm. Doesn't that just glow? If you watch my Namo Pemo blog, you'll know that I didn't start her oils before Namo Pemo edit, but mm, she was worth the wait. I oil paint my manes and tails in semi transparent layers using one part liquid to about three parts paint to give me the transparency. This is twice as much liquid as I was using before, but it's still a small amount. I begin with the lightest colors, leaning into the streaky pigment look that comes from applying a thin layer of oils. In this case, when you stroke the paint in the same direction as the hair, that pigment streaking starts to look like fine hair strands. I work in the mid-tone colors, then the darker color, and once I've coated the hair from top to bottom, I let that dry overnight. 
I love that I get to take my time with oil painted hair much more than with acrylic painted manes and tails. But the trade-off is that I can only do one layer per session, otherwise I risk creating a muddy colored mess if I try to layer too much paint on one session. I begin the Rapicano pattern by jotting down some guide hairs with a white charcoal pencil. I like to use this pencil because if I put down a mark I don't like, it's easy to wipe off. I start blocking in large areas of hair using my creamy yellow oil paint mixtures and a technique featured in Heather Bullock's Ronin tutorial, linked below, where she uses a frayed filbert brush. Now since Heather's technique is for a different pattern, Roan instead of Rabicano, I needed to deviate from her tutorial and try other tools and techniques on my own to get the linear look that distinguishes Rabicano. While I find them a bit daunting, eyes are also one of my favorite things to paint because they hold so much of the horse's personality in them. I begin by defining the shape of the eyeballs with a darker color, usually brown or black. I mix off-white for the eye whites, adding a bit of burnt sand to the mixture so I can paint the very corners of the eye whites with pink. What follows are concentric circles working from dark to light and back to dark. This is a simple, although not always easy way to paint the iris. On larger scales such as this mare, I can use a very pointed round to add some extra detail to the iris before the final step, which is to paint the somewhat rectangular shape of the pupil. The hooves I'm looking forward to as I really wanted to roll up my sleeves and see what techniques I could try in oil and see how differently the process looks in oil versus the acrylic process I've used over the years. I'm using a lot of the same steps and brushes that I normally use, but this time I'm really leaning into the wet blending. Whereas with acrylics, I lean into dry brushing. Before varnishing, oils need even longer to continue curing than they do when painting new layers, and I have success waiting about 6 weeks to 2 months depending on how many layers I painted. Once she reaches the 2 month mark, I will varnish her with Windsor & Newton Professional Picture Varnish to protect her paint from scratches, finger oils, and dust. I hope you enjoyed this series on the creation of my Namo Pemo horse, and I thank you so much for giving me a little of your time out of your day to watch. I hope an exchange this inspires you to try your own creative projects, or perhaps it's simply entertained. And with that, I'll let you get back to your day. Bye!